Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Harvey Young. I have the pleasure of moderating uh, this fantastic discussion, uh, uh, you know, celebrating uh, the launch, the release of LaDonna Forrest Grin's uh, uh, latest book, Assist is in the Struggle, which is her second book. And it's, 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 it's a must grab, it's a must buy, it's a must order. So, you know, sort of, sort of on the side box of your computer, start sort of like ordering it right now from Northwestern University Press, put in the, the code Forrest Grin to get 35% off. And I'll say this again at the end. Uh, I want to take a moment to introduce our panelists. Um, we're going to have a conversation that will last about uh, half an hour. Uh, if you have questions along the way, I encourage you uh, via YouTube chat to just, just down below here to type in whatever questions you might have, and then we'll make sure that we uh, tackle them. Uh, but our, our panelists, allow me to introduce them. And I apologize for reading, uh, but they're so accomplished. Uh, I want to make sure that I don't miss any of their accolades as I relay um, you know, their achievements to you. Uh, so I will begin. Uh, with Dr. Aduke Aramu, uh, who is an award-winning artist and self-identified revolutionary. Uh, Aduke is perhaps best known for her children's musical, The Liberation of Mother Goose, and has since written a dozen musicals and produced her works across the United States, Nigeria, Ghana, Bermuda, Jamaica, Barbados, Tanzania, and throughout Europe. Uh, so mass, all over the place. Uh, in addition to her creative work, uh, Aduga has dedicated much of her time uh, in becoming a public school principal after earning a PhD uh, in education administration and supervision from New York University. After the closing of Harlem Children's Theater in 1990, uh, she produced a national talk radio, The Princess Chronicles on WXRP Metro in Atlanta and founded the Atlanta-based production company Dove LLC. Uh, as CEO of Dove, uh, uh, Dr. Aramu is working to adapt the liberation of Mother Goose, now retitled Goose, uh, into a series for the screens so for both television and film. Uh, in 2020, her lifetime achievement received, in, 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 sorry, 19, in 2020, sorry, 2010, her lifetime of achievement received commendation from the U.S. House of Representatives. Uh, so welcome. I'm so, I'm so thrilled to have you here. Thank you so much. Uh, and I also want to introduce uh, Professor Kathy A. Perkins. Uh, who is a scholar and lighting designer. Uh, she's also the editor and co-editor of six anthologies focusing on women from Africa and the diaspora. So, you know, you know in addition to ordering Sisters of the Struggle, make sure you order all of Professor Perkins' books. I have, I think I have most of them on my bookshelf, actually. Um, uh, and in addition to serving uh, as a senior editor for the Rutledge Companion of African American Theater and Performance, a recipient of numerous research and design awards, including the Fulbright, the NEH, the NAACP Image Award, I want you to brace yourself. It's a staggering list here. Berkeley Repertory, Arena Stage, St. Louis Black Repertory, Baltimore Center Stage, the Goodman Theater, the Steppenwolf Theater, Yale Repertory Theater, Manhattan Theater Club, uh, Actors Theater of Louisville, uh, American Conservatory, Congo Square, and the Grahamstown Festival of South Africa. A graduate of Howard University and the University of Michigan, uh, uh, Professor Perkins is Professor Emerita at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Kathy, it's so good to see you again. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, and and, and our, 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 our featured author, uh, LaDonna Forsgren, is an associate professor in the Department of Film, Television, and Theater, concurrent faculty in Gender Studies and Program, uh, in the Gender Studies Program, and affiliate faculty in the Department of Africana Studies at the University of Notre Dame. Her first book, uh, which came out two years ago, uh, In Search of Our Warrior Mothers, Women Dramatists, The Black Arts Movement, investigates the works and careers of Marty Evans Charles, J.E. Franklin, Sonia Sanchez, and Barbara Antier. Uh, and I encourage you to get that book. So many books, to, like there's a whole shelf of books you're gonna have soon. Uh, and her second book, which is what brings us today, um, here today, Sisters in the Struggle, an Oral History of the Black Arts Movement, uh, theater and performance uh, with Northwestern University Press is coming out soon, uh, this, like any day now, right? Um, and it explores the art and activism of pioneering Black women, intellectual of the 1960s and 1970s. She has also published her research in academic journals and book collections. Uh, she recently received, and there's been a huge buzz all across social media about this, uh, the American Society for Theater Research's Oscar G. Brockett Prize uh, for the outstanding uh, article for her article in The Wiz, which was published in Theater Survey. And she currently serves as the vice president and slash conference planner for the Mid-America Theater Conference and is working on a third book uh, project that explores queer black feminist spectatorship in contemporary musical theater. So LaDonna, thank you for bringing us all here with your extraordinary work. Thank you for agreeing to moderate this discussion. I really appreciate it. Uh, and what brings us here together is LaDonna's book, Sisters uh, in the Struggle. And 
uh, what's worth noting is it is a dynamic, it is a engaging, it is a persuasive, it is a page turning uh, oral history in which LaDonna sort of sits down with uh, many of the uh, people who shaped the black arts movement uh, to hear stories that unfortunately have often not been included within uh, sort of historical accounts thus far. Um, and it is through her work, through her rigorous ethnographic scholarship that you as a reader, as that we as a reader get a chance to sort of sit and have an audience with people who've made history. Uh, and what LaDonna notes, and this is something that we're experiencing right now in 2020, you know, if you think about sort of the state of, not to get political, but if you think of like the state of Georgia and the work of Stacey Abrams and how, you know, you know black women have actually led the way uh, in terms of uh, sort of rescuing and saving this society, this world so many different times, but haven't received the credit, haven't received the spotlight, haven't received the recognition. What LaDonna does is she's writing the history anew of the black arts movement by spotlighting people who have been transformative to the theater that exists today. Uh, so that is what she's doing, but I wanna give LaDonna Forsgren, our author, a chance to say more. So LaDonna, why don't you tell us a bit more about your book? Okay, thank you so much. And I also did write down my thoughts because I have so many thoughts and so I had to make sense of it. So I'm going to share with you, but before I do that, I just want to thank you, Harvey, Aduke, and Kathy for being here tonight and celebrating the publication of this book. And it is out right now. So I just wanna begin by sharing the fact that the catalyst for writing Sisters in the Struggle occurred more than eight years ago. After passing my successful dissertation defense, Harvey let me choose a place to celebrate. And this was on him, his treat. And so as we scarfed down red mango froyo, he advised me to do the following for my second book. He said, add to my small collection of oral history interviews and use the methodology found in E. Patrick Johnson's award-winning book, Sweet Tea, Black Gay Men in the South. Now, Patrick, I'm a foodie. He, he also makes a killer, and I mean a killer homemade red velvet cake, he also offered the support and guidance that I needed along the way. And so of course this book would not have been possible without the black women intellectuals, including Aduke and Kathy right here, who graciously shared their life stories with me. So growing up in a household of strong black women, I have always valued our cultural traditions and I avidly listened to our stories of struggle and resistance from a very young age. But it wasn't until I entered college and I was the first in my family to do so that I learned of a disconnect between my own perception of black womanhood and societies. Yet it was also within these historically white colleges and institutions that I was first introduced to a formalized knowledge known as black feminist thought. Time and time again, I returned to Tony K. Bambara's 1984 essay, Salvation is the Issue for Inspiration. Bambara writes, quote, stories are important. They keep us alive. In the ships, in the camps, in the quarters, fields, prisons, on the road, on the run, underground, under siege, in the throes, on the verge, the storyteller snatches us back from the edge to hear the next chapter, in which we are the subjects, we the hero of the tales, our lives preserved, how it was, how it be, passing it along the relay, that is the work I do to produce stories that save our lives. So Sisters in the Struggle contains the stories of Black women's art and activism during a tumultuous period in US history. Black Americans struggled against the effects of systemic racism, including poverty, poor healthcare, unemployment, underemployment, inadequate housing in public schools, police brutality, and unequal voting rights to name a few. These concerns led to mass demonstration and movement to save our lives. And in many ways, mirrors what we saw happening this past summer. But the truth is, Black women, cis or otherwise, have never stood idly by waiting for the government or some other entity to take action. Rather, they use their voices as mothers, educators, designers, playwrights, performers, producers, directors, dancers, and as grassroots activists to galvanize their communities into action. Their stories, many of which occurred more than 50 years ago, continue to save our lives. Patrice uh, Kahn Colliers, co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement, acknowledges Black women's long-standing tradition of fighting alongside their comrades to make this world a more equitable and just society. 
Con Collier's writes in her 2017 book, When They Call You a Terrorist, a Black Lives Matter memoir, the quote, we do this work today because on another day, work was done by Asada Shakur, Angela Davis, Miss Major, the Black Panther Party, the members of the Black Arts Movement, SNCC, the RNA, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Ella Baker, and so many others. We owe you and the world a debt of gratitude, end quote. So Sisters in the Struggle creates space for 30 Black women, their children, and comrades to share their vision of the past. And so doing the book, the book aims to recover and celebrate this important chapter in Black women's history. That being said, I completely understand that Sisters in the Struggle is just the beginning. There is so much more work to do and so much more we don't know. I interviewed only a small fraction of Black women who labored during this era more of their stories need to be told and recorded before it is too late. For example, within months of our interview, the incredible playwright, poet, and dancer, Ndisafi Shange passed. Now, I know we are all saddened by this loss and the loss of many other of our, our ancestors, and yet they have left a powerful legacy for us. I would like to conclude by sharing with you Shange's final words that she gave me during our interview. And this is one of, if it isn't the last interview, it's one of the last interviews that she gave. So when I asked her, what do you want people to know and remember about your life's work? This is what she said. I want people to know I try to leave memories of the hopes and the joy and the laughter of people of color especially Black English speakers in the Western Hemisphere, for generations to share so that our history will be more than dates and places and what white people did to us. I want our struggles to be understood as not only historical phenomenon, but as personal trials and triumphs because the masses cannot move without the individual taking a step. So thank you so much for listening. And now just in, in keeping with, with this, the whole book project, that is why we have Kathy and Aduke here with us today, because this work centers their voices. And so this book launch is in keeping with that. So thank you. Thank, thank you, Adana. I, I want to invite Aduke to uh, you know, sort of share your experiences uh, with the founding of of the Harlem Children's Theater Company, uh, and then also whatever thoughts you might have related to uh, your upcoming work with, with you know, on American Black Princess, the stage musical. So if you can take it wherever thank, you want to go with this. Thank you. Um, I want to start with how I got here, and that goes back um, several decades. And I think it started as a little girl. I think that the making of a, a very talented, um, game changer or revolutionary or arts um, progressive woman starts at a very early age. With me, I was groomed to do this. And the more I think about it, because I've read um, Professor LaDonna's book several times now, and I was just overwhelmed with the um, grandeur of women and how phenomenal this woman's movement really was. Some of the women I didn't know, even though we were colleagues, because we were all working so hard and we didn't have an opportunity to meet each other like tonight. However, we were all working at the same time and we were all creating explosive, progressive arts movements in our poetry, in our plays, in our literature. As a little girl, my family were from Savannah, Georgia. And they did what most black families do. They migrated to the North after my mother and father graduated from Savannah State University. However, when they arrived in New York, after I was born, there was a dramatic split and my father and mother separated and they got divorced. So I then was brought up in Brooklyn, New York, which was the center of urban um, chaos, confusion, plight, but also cultural, um, a cultural urban community. Whereas my father who lived in Harlem became an icon and a mogul economically, I began my little cultural trip at five years old. Being that my family on my mother's side were Geechees, if you know anything about the history of African-Americans, the Geechees came out of, of Savannah and South Carolina. And my mother, from a very early age, began to tell me a history of my family 
This took place in the projects in Brooklyn, which at the time were not called projects. They were called settlement houses. And there were a lot of Jews living there, a lot of Irish and Italians. So I grew up in a settlement house project that was um, diverse culturally. So my mother um, began to tell me stories about my grandfather, who was Native American, who rode a horse and had feathers, and the rest of my family who came over from the island of Jamaica, who was Native American and Africans. My family was very proud. I didn't know that I was basically the descendant of slaves in my family because they didn't discuss it. Um, they discussed how fabulous the family was. They talked about my uncles who all were strong, very handsome black men. They all went into the military. They all carried guns. They were very proud. My grandfather was the founder of the oldest black church in Savannah. And he was an education advocate and he was a revolutionary. Most of my family historically were involved somehow with the underground movement of with Harriet Tubman, my mother said. They were very aggressively proud people. And the women were very beautiful, very fabulous, and took no prisoners. That was what I heard as a little girl. My family used to um, gather in Brooklyn because being that they were all in the South, they came to Brooklyn and they would sit in the living room and laugh and eat food. They ate a lot of rice, which gave me that connection with the Geechee. I found out later on, it also was very African. Rice and beans, and they stayed up all night, and I was in the little bedroom um, listening. From very little as a child, I was a storyteller. I had I took the stories they told me, and I told all the kids in my neighborhoods. So I told the Jews, I wasn't a slave. I was a princess, and we go back hundreds of years because I had heard all these stories. So I didn't have a sense of inferiority complex or a sense that I wasn't just a fabulous little Black girl. And I think God, my ancestors, my family, really paved the way for me to become a duke from Gwent. Also, the second um, influence in my life as a child was the church. I went to a Baptist church that was political. I remember Martin Luther King coming to the church. And I, I didn't know until I was grown that it was Martin Luther King because I didn't know who this man was. And the church was black. And everybody was yelling and screaming, and it was phenomenal. The pastor was from Virginia, and he was a, quote, uh, member of the civil rights movement. My church was theater. Um, I think Kathy can relate to this. The whole church was theatrical. The ushers were theatrical and dance. They marched down the aisle, you know, dancing. and they had this little step they did. We had a, a choir director who was a HBCU graduate who had five choirs, and the music that came out of the choirs goes from gospel to jazz music. I sang in the choir uh, contemporary um, religious songs. So I heard music everywhere I went. Also, the pastor was a theatrical um, personality because if you know anything about Baptist ministers, they are theatrical. They have storytelling. They have variations in their voices and whatever. And the last part was the costuming. In my church, everybody dressed up. So my, that was my introducing to costume. No one came to church without dressing. It didn't matter economically how much money you had, but you were in church on Sunday with a hat on, gloves, your best dress, my little white dress with the pigtails and the ribbons. All of this is building up to what happened to me. Then from that, my mother decided, because I was very restless, um, Harvey, I couldn't sit still. She didn't know what this was. So she began to, take, to introduce me to music because that was the only thing I would sit for. So she took me to City College, which had concerts of white musicals like The Sound of Music, um, The King and I, and I knew all the songs. So when I got to my, quote, white middle school, and they would ask about music, I would start singing from The King and I, and they thought I was a mad hatter because I knew the songs. My mother also um, had me play the violin. I have no reason why the violin. So I was playing the violin from age um, eight all the way to 18, and I was a classically trained musician, and I knew Beethoven and Bach and everything. What I didn't know was 
that I was really a black spirit. I really didn't know what was happening. All I knew that I was being um, given all of this energy and mantle. And then there were women in the community, and I think Madonna talks about this in the book. There were women in the in the community who were what we would call in Africa the elders who let me sit in. I met Shirley Chisholm and didn't know it was Shirley Chisholm because my godmother, who was a freedom fighter with a hat, and she was really a bourgeois freedom fighter. She was the one who put Congressman Ed Towns in office. She was on the committee with um, Shirley Chisholm, Mary Pinkett. Brooklyn was a political dynasty for Black women. And I sat at the kitchen table and listened to these Black women yell and smile because it was very massive in Brooklyn. That's what Brooklyn did for me. And on top of that, I got adopted around 14 years old because I was very, very bright for some reason, um, Harvey, um, on summers. I would read 15 to 20 books in the summer because I had a, a fascination with fantasy. I, I didn't like Brooklyn because it was a little bit too urban for me. And my new play, American Black Princess, which does my life story through a quarry poem, talks about the agony I felt growing up in Brooklyn because for some reason I was a water girl or a country girl. I didn't understand why there were so many harsh vibrations coming out of this culture and it scared me. And because of that fear, I began to write poetry. These women decided because I was such a delicate little flower girl, as they called me, they took me under their wing and the little poor girl from Brooklyn who was living in the projects became a debutante. Now, those of you who know anything about Black culture, this is very odd because I was the poorest little girl in the neighborhood because my parents were divorced. But they decided I was going to be the model. So I became a debutante and all my stuff was purchased. The dress, we had to do a class on how to act, how to eat. So I'm being groomed for something which I knew not what it was. And I was queen of the ball and it was in the newspapers, which is all fascinating because I'm 16 years old. I don't know what this is, but I'm being poured into by the ancestors, by women who knew there was something about me that was just frisky. I was very self-confident. I never had a inferiority complex. So I really want to break it to my white counterparts. I didn't have an ego problem ever. I knew that I was a princess. And through all my plays, the theme of royalty comes through because I believe that early and I was, I used to dress up as a princess. I wore dresses in the house. I did little stories with my sister, but I was always the queen. So we're either it's psychologically some interesting stuff going on here, but all of this ancestral power is coming out of me. Then I go to high school and, and at Brooklyn, there was a group of black intellectuals who all of us were poets. Can you imagine being a poet at 14? We all were poets. And we were taken under the wing of John O'Killens. John O'Killens was the daddy in the neighborhood. He was really well off. And we went to his house every weekend. And he told us stories and talked about the black arts movement, about politics. And his daughter, um, Barbara O'Killens, Barbara O'Killens was one of my best friends. So we just knew we were special. We just knew something was going on with us. We didn't know what it was, but we knew that as black kids, because our, our neighborhood was so cultural in terms of Jewish and Italian, I, we wanted to know what, where's our culture? And this started at 14 and 15. Why am I not being celebrated when the Jews have bar mitzvah and they go to Israel? Why, where are we going? And this was a question that bothered me a great deal because I had studied enough European culture that I really could have been a white girl, for real. I mean, I really knew European culture. I knew Beethoven, Bach. I knew everything about white theater, their politics. I read all the books. I knew that um, Abraham Lincoln didn't really free us because he wanted to, because he has. I had all that down. So now something's going on here. I go to college and there's no black people at Hunter. Stop me when it's time for Kathy to go because you know I'm a storyteller and I can go just say hands up, Duque, let's move on. At Hunter, there were 25 black people came in my freshman class. Hunter was a really upper middle class school for girls and everybody was rich. 
everybody was white and everybody was really sophisticated and classy. So the 25 of us stuck together. That was my first communal blackness. We ate lunch together, we studied together, we played sororities and fraternities together, not because I was a feminist, but because that was the hardest thing to do because we partied a lot and we danced. Dance then got introduced. We danced every weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Dance became very important to us because we were so frustrated because I was the only black person in the theater department. My friends were the only black in every department at the college. So we knew basically that we needed to be comrades and that's tribal. I find that later on when I go to Africa. So the 25 black kids, we closed down Hunter. We decided after I invited Stokely Carmichael, I had read it, but he came to Hunter. I have no idea why Stokely came to Hunter because it was only 25 black people in my freshman class. <laughs> he came and spoke and I interviewed him and wrote an article in the newspaper, I was the editor, and he had a really, um, spiritual conversation with me. I told him I was confused. I knew I was black. I didn't know my history. I was, I knew I was political. I knew I didn't like what I was seeing. He told me to go for it. You got this. And, and we talked for hours. Hunter got closed down for a week and none of us got expelled because we were only 25 black kids. So they can't expel the whole freshman class. So they gave us a black studies department and we got Dr. Pearl Primus and John Henry Clark, who I became very close with. You see what's happening here? There's like something developing historically for me to go to. Pearl Primus took me under her wings as her godchild. Yeah. So I became culturally, phenomenally um, in tune with the spiritual aspect of blackness. Yeah, now I'm gonna stop here because, to... because it goes on and on and it continues. This is a hint right here of how amazing this book is. <laughs> right, this is extraordinary. I think this is a good uh, moment. I want to bring Kathy in um, and talk about uh, because your college experience was 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 different um, in terms of because you were at Howard University, um, you know, and 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 maybe perhaps you could talk about sort of your experience at that point and also sort of more uh, generally in terms of uh, black designers within the black arts movement. I uh, grew up in Mobile, Alabama. Um, segregated um, South um, during the civil rights movement. And I grew up with a, a very close knit black community. My parents were working class people. So I was always taught that, we were always taught that we were special. And I was always involved in the arts either through um, my church, either through school, or there was a civil rights group that I used to work with. We used to do small skits and everything. And so, I went to Howard knowing that I was going to become this famous actress and going off to Broadway. So my freshman year of, at Howard, I'm working backstage because at this time, if you're a freshman, everyone has to do everything. You have to do light crews, you know, set crew, costume, whatever. And so I was working on the lighting crew for a play by Alice Childress called Wine in the Wilderness. I had never heard of Alice Childress. And my best friend at the time, who was a sophomore in lighting, was sitting backstage before the curtain goes up. And, and out of the blue, he says, what are you going to do with a BFA in acting? This is 1973. And I said, of course, I'm going to Broadway. And in so many words, he says, well, you know, you, I've seen you act. You're OK. But I've seen you hang in focus lights. And why don't you consider that? Because if you go into technical theater, you'll never be a waitress or anything. And we also had this roadhouse, it's still there, roadhouse at Howard called Crampton Auditorium, which is a 2000 seat. And it was a touring house where anybody who was anybody back in the 70s came through there. And he said, why don't you come and work over there? You know, we always need more black people behind the scenes. And I took him up on his offer and I did concerts and, and I did switch my major. So I was designing shows in the department, but I spent a lot of my time next door in the, the touring house and just about, and this was the age of funk. So I did lighting for like Cool in the Game, the Funkadelics, um, Shaka Khan, you, if anybody you can imagine. So I just gained so much experience. And by my senior year, um, I realized I was the highest paid student at Howard because each year Howard would put out in the, uh, the uh, 
campus paper, you know, the students who made the most money. They didn't list us by name, but they listed the job. And it's like, whoa, okay. Because by then my senior year, I was in charge of the, the entire technical staff at Howard. And so I did a lot of concerts while I was in undergrad at Howard. I had amazing mentors, both men and women, uh, who really encouraged me because when I decided I was going to go to uh, grad school, they really rallied behind me and really supported me. And my biggest mentor, who was the director of the uh, Turing House, he didn't teach, but he, he was my biggest mentor. He prepared me for what to expect when I got out of DC as a black person. Uh, then I went to graduate school at the University of Michigan. And that's when I realized that I uh, was going to do research. Uh, my first day of graduate school, I asked this young white guy for the orientation for um, designers. And he wanted to know why. And I said, because I'm a design major. And we got into this very brief conversation about, I didn't know black people did anything other than perform. And, and he said, I have a PhD in theater. So I couldn't talk long. I said, well, yes, I'm coming from DC, Chocolate City. 90% of the people I work with were black people. So I know black designers exist because you're talking to one. And, um, and I just remember after my orientation ended, I remember going to the library. University of Michigan has an extensive theater library collection. And he was right. There was nothing about black people behind the scenes. And I remember calling my sister late that night because I was in the library for about five or six hours and telling her what had happened, my encounter with the young guy. And, and she said, you need to write a book. You need to do research on blacks behind the scenes. And you know, my response was, you know, I don't know how to do research. I'm an artist, not a scholar. But anyway, to make a long story short, eventually I began to do research on blacks behind the scenes. But after graduation, my first job was with Diane McIntyre uh, with Sounds in Motion. But going back a little bit, we, we talked about the black arts movement and LaDonna and I talked about that. And I've always had problems with those dates, 65 to 75. 1975, I'm at Howard, but in no, I don't remember anybody saying, oh, it's 1975, the movement's over. <laughs> I, always, I always felt like the movement really took off because in 75, we're talking about Intizaki Shange's for Color Girl. A lot of my classmates ended up going to Broadway, going on the touring show because of that. When I get to, oh, and also I'm in DC. I don't know why people give New York credit for everything, but I'm in DC. We had the Black um, DC Black Rep, we had uh, Jones and Hayward's Dance Company, we had DC Black Dance, DC Black, yeah, Dance Company. There was all of this stuff going on in DC. Uh, a lot of stuff I couldn't keep up with because I was busy working. But by the time I got to New York, we're talking about 78. I'm working with Diane McIntyre. Uh, there are all of these things that are going on. And my, my world wasn't just theater. I was involved in theater, dance, I worked with what was called Dance Africa. Some of you all may have known who Chuck Davis was. 1978, he started what was called the Black um, uh, Dance Africa at the Brooklyn Academy of Music from 82 to 84. I was the lighting designer for that. And then we also had, there was the Thelma Hill Dance Company that was happening in Brooklyn. Uh, I was able to work with um, uh, the Richard Allen with Hazel Bryant. Um, you know, there was just so much going on. Um, you know, I was like lighting all over the place. I mean, I was only in the New York area from like 78 through 85, but I was very, very busy. I was working with Woody King at the uh, New Federal Theater. Then I was also at Negro Ensemble Company. And then I was also working with a lot of Black South African exiles. So there was a lot of work for a designer. And, and you talked about the black women designers at that time. And just going back to Howard, when I was at Howard, there were at least six of us in my department in lighting. So we didn't feel like we were an anomaly until we got outside of the black theater community. Um, so there was just a lot of work. You know, you had costume designers, Judy Deering, Myrna Collar Lee, there was Edna Watson, Tony Leslie James, um, a lot of black women costume designers, not as many lighting designers. There was Shirley Pendergrass, who was my mentor, uh, who deceased uh, two years ago. And she was the mentor for so many, not just black women, but black people uh, going into lighting. So it was Shirley, I had the opportunity to work with Shirley. 
Um, she helped me get into the designers union. She gave me the opportunity to work on my very first Broadway show. And by the way, I didn't design a show on Broadway. I assisted as a designer on Broadway. Um, so Shirley was just incredible. And she also mentored people like Antoinette, Antoinette Times and Melody Beale, Sandra Ross. So there were several black women in lighting uh, in the New York area. And like I say, there were many more in costume design. And we worked, we, we worked a great deal. Um, I didn't have any problems with sexism at the time. Uh, like I said, most of the people who hired me, you know, it was a lot of black men as well as the black women. So it was a, it was a very good time for me when I was in New York uh, and I still did concerts, you know. Uh, I was also teaching full time. So it was easy for me to come in on the weekends to do dance shows and concerts and to do full length plays, which I would have to do during my holiday season. Um, but yes, it was, it was a very good time. Like I said, festivals, it seems like to me that things just took off after 75. Um, so I was worried about, okay, why was the black arts movement over in 75? I don't know. Uh, we didn't call it the black arts movement. We just said, you know, we're doing black theater and we're just gonna keep moving. And so things were moving the whole time I was in the New York area. So anything else? I know we're on a, a schedule. No, that, 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 was, that, was, that was fantastic. I, I wanna ask, so, so for those who are watching down. again via YouTube, uh, remember, give any questions, just, just type them in the YouTube chat um, and then we will tackle them. Uh, I wanna, uh, you know, sort of ask LaDonna a question, uh, which is uh, within, within your book, uh, Sisters in the Struggle, uh, you talk about, um, you know, we we're outlining the project and, and your experiences as an ethnographer and an interviewer. You mentioned that every so often, and probably more often um, than not, uh, you would you would sit down and meet with people, and they would have note cards, right? You know, uh, as a way of of of, of responding and, and remembering. Um, uh -huh. uh, and, and and what I what I find really powerful about that is that you know there's a real sense of urgency, right? To you know yes. to, to relay the record, to get it straight, to like you know to to, to make sure history is recorded. Uh, my question for you is, you know, how did you approach sort of tackling that responsibility of, of being the person, you know, who would A, receive th these stories, uh, but then also, uh, you know, choose and decide the manner with which, which ones to privilege and how to preserve them for the future? You know, so how do you tackle that sense of responsibility? Yeah. I, I would say that it, it weighed heavily on my mind from the beginning of the project, even until even today, deciding who to include in this book launch and knowing that there were many wonderful women that I could have included even tonight in terms of this conversation. And so I, for me, I felt a great deal of responsibility to get the story right. And so one of the things that, that I made sure that I did during each and every interview is I came prepared. I researched their work. I read reviews of their work if there if I didn't have access to their plays or to their designs, right? A, a lot of the the this book is essentially creating an archive, right? So I made sure that I was very diligent in finding out as much information as I could beforehand. And during the interviews, one of the most powerful things that I learned to do is to just listen. And I know that sounds like, well, that's pretty simple. It actually is really taxing to just listen. And by just listening, I'm also reaffirming what they're saying. Just like as I, I, I quickly found out if I remained completely silent, then there was this sense of, is LaDonna actually listening? And then I noticed the conversation just became stilted, but it almost felt like a black church service where I had to, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, these nonverbal things that needed to happen. And, and I also realized that these women wanted to hear my story before um, many of them opened up to me. They wanted to know why I was doing this project. And so I had the whole scholarly academic pursuit was not interesting to them. It was not a compelling reason. I had to let them know that I was personally invested in telling their stories and getting it right. And by getting it right, meaning that all of the, narr all of the narrators involved in the book had the opportunity to review the transcripts and to make sure that I got it right. And even at the time where we went into proofs, I had some narrators who said, I would like to see those proofs and they requested changes. And until the very, very end, I allowed them to do that. And luckily the press allowed me to do that. But it was really important for me to get their stories right because there was this sense of urgency. And many of these women, it felt like they had been waiting for decades for their story to be told. 
and they had something really compelling that they wanted to share. And along with, with what Kathy mentioned about the Black arts movement not being set completely just in Harlem, but it's this national movement that's happening. It was very important for me to give uh, a sense of the regional variation that was taking place. That's why I was able to interview Dr. Doris Derby of the Free Southern Theater. Her contributions as a photojournalist and as a, co, uh, a theater founder and just a grassroots activist, in many ways, her story hadn't always been told and hadn't been told correctly. And so I spent the day with her, the entire day. And there were times where I was hungry and she's listening to this. Doris, Dr. Doris Derby is listening tonight. There were times where I was like, I should have eaten before, but I spent the entire day with her. It was a privilege and it was an honor. She laid out all of her memorabilia from the civil rights movement. I saw images that don't appear in books. It was this treasure trove of, of our history and our culture just displayed on her dining room table. And it's one of those moments that I will always remember and I will treasure that she was willing to share a bit of her life with me. And so I sincerely hope that I got the story right. And, and, and it seems based on the feedback I've been given by the narrators, by these women that I did. And if there's any fault in the book, it's mine, not theirs. So I take it very seriously and the work continues, right? That's, it's, it's so, so, so Aduke, you mentioned that uh, you, you've read the book you know, you know, multiple times. Um, uh, what, what, what was your first thought in terms of, you know, sort of the history that gets told, you know, at large? Uh, and also, what, what was your own personal response to, to being present there, you know, in, 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 within these pages? What, what most impressed me about the book was that all of us were pretty much connected like we were, were a universal force. For example, Kathy Purpose mentioned Dance Africa. Um, several of the um, dancers, I was very close to Chuck Davis also. And several of the dancers I took actually off of stage and took with me on one of my tours to Barbados. I hired them. I said to Chuck, I need two of your people and I need to do a show in Barbados and I need three drummers. We were all connected. Um, I also worked with Myrna Lee. She designed my set at the Public Theater along with um, Joseph Walker from the River Niger. Um, Lilius White was in the Liberation Mother Goose at the Public Theater. And I spent a lot of time at the home of Gilbert Moses. And I hung out at a bar with Douglas Turner Ward, who he produced me at the NEC. We were all working. I worked all day Saturday from seven until midnight or three in the morning and all day Sunday afternoon. We were working. Um, Cheryl Lee Ralph was my drama teacher before she got Dream Girls. So all of us, some and the, the, the puppets, the brewery puppets did all of my puppets at the Apollo Theater and at the Kennedy Center. We were all together. I knew Judy Deering because her husband, John Park, went to Nigeria with me in 1977 with Estac. We were all one spiritual movement of fabulous art. I knew Barbara Ann Kier very well. I said in her living room, she tried to get me to join. I said, no, I'm forming the Harlem Films Theater, but we're sisters and we'll just walk together. Because I had been to Africa right after college and it changed my life. That's where Sanchez said her spiritual blackness came. I studied African culture because as a scholar, I wanted to know everything about African culture. I spent um, months in Nigeria. I met Fela. So when the play came to Broadway, I knew Fela's interview. I sat with him at his temple, at his feet. I knew the Nigerian writers. I hung out in Trinidad and Barbados learning about their culture, especially Carnival in Trinidad, which is why so many of my plays are costumed to the max. Myrna Lee and all of them, I did a lot of costuming, a lot of dance, and that was the influence of Chuck Davis and Abdel Salam, who I love, who I would call to direct. And I said, I want dance, 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 and I want costumes, I want people flying off the, the wall. And I, at the Apollo Theater, we had a dancer jump from the balcony to the stage. That was the Duque. I created what I call an African perspective of Black theater, and I dealt with young people because I believe that if we lost the young people in American culture, we lost our next generation. So I mentored 
all the children. They came at seven. I had all the jazz musicians' children. I had all the movie star children came to 42nd Street with me. They worked all day and night. They got locked up. The parents couldn't come in. They stayed outside till three in the morning. I said, if you knock on the door, your child is gone. <laughs> uh, this is a total educational, political, arts indoctrination. We are going to immerse you. One of my um, students, Deirdre Tate, became vice president of Motown. That was my kids. My kids took over the industry. They were everywhere. They were like, I was the Pied Piper, and they were the little people. They learned everything about the arts. I worked with all of the um, actors who came from across the street on 42nd Street. Kathy, I can't remember the name of that housing. All of them worked with me because I was on 42nd Street. I hired everybody. I worked with Joseph Walker, Woody King. I knew Roger Furman. He was my big daddy. So was Ellis Hazen, who was my godfather. Bozer Rivers mentored me. I worked with him with Sarafina. We were one big cultural phenomenal movement who knew our consciousness as Black people. We were phenomenal. We were fabulous. Wherever we went, we had sold out productions. They came in Paris and watched us perform at the Eiffel Tower. I don't know what that movement was. It was like a total a uh, phenomena of cultural dynamics and P Professor LaDonna has captured it in her book. I, I never knew Kathy Perkins until today. But when I read, I'm serious, when I read yeah. her, her work, I said, I know her. I think I met her at BAM. I think I saw her um, because I had lighting designers that she worked with. She might have designed one of my shows. I don't even know because there were so many of us oh and God. we moved fast. We yeah. were the speed kids. We went through productions like, uh, I could write a play in a week. We so, did, we, so, so, so just to hop in here, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you've just sort of crystallized part of the, uh, you know, sort of the magic of this book, right? In that it, it really shows the constellation of, of artists uh, and influences and how, inter and how interconnected people are. Uh, and then too often when one writes a history, you tend to sort of focus upon one person you, and you lose sight of that network. You lose sight of the innovators. You lose sight, uh, you know, within, let's, let, let's just call it out for what it is, you know, within, sort of the, within the misogyny of, of, of history writing sometimes, you lose sight of the women who actually made, um, made these achievements. Um, there, speaking, of, speaking of that, there's a question that came in from Gabe, and this is uh, directed and went offered to LaDonna or Kathy. Um, so, uh, and, it's, and, the, and Gabe says, uh, and I quote, uh, Professor Forsgren, I, I first learned the term historiogra historiogra historiography uh, in your class two years ago. Can you uh, <laughs> offer any insight, advice to art students as they do research for their projects? Ooh, I think for me, the whole idea for the first book came about because a student asked a question. And so I just want, want to first just validate the into intellectual prowess of, of undergraduate students. They are incredible. And I think my advice for you would be to just ask a good question, right? And these good questions are simple. The first question that, that I asked that became the, the whole work of the first book was, what were Black women writing? And how were their works realized in production, right? What were they writing during the 1960s and 70s? It's a very basic question, yet no one had thought to ask the question. And with this second book, I wanted to know how did Black women, not just as playwrights, but as directors, as theater founders, as performers, as designers, how did they theorize the Black aesthetic? And how did they actualize their vision of Black art? And that became the book. So I think asking a simple yet basic question is the way to go. And I'm glad you remembered historiography. That's exciting to me. Totally nerding out. And, and, and Kathy, I, I want to offer the same question to you because you, uh, you know, through your anthologies, you know, have really um, succeeded in casting, you know, a big bright light, um, specifically on Black women playwrights. Um, uh, and you know, what was your process in terms of of, of sure generating that light, right, in, in order to write that history? So how did you tackle? Uh, you know, the, the topic of inclusion and how to sort of broaden our collective consciousness and awareness. You know, like I said, I started because, um, you know, people were telling me that, you know, Black people didn't exist back, you know, behind the scenes other than on, on stage. And 
and that's where it started from. And I'm not trained as a historiographer or I just went out, started talking to people that I knew. And then one of the things I discovered in talking with people who work behind the scenes versus, you know, performers, you know, most people who work behind the scene, no one had ever given them the time of day. And so when I would get with them, and I guess because I'm also in the area, they just poured out their hearts about the business and everything. So it was, it was fairly easy. And one of the things I really want to commend LaDonna for this project, because I feel like someone is picking up the mantle <laughs> from what I sort of started from. And I know there are other scholars out here uh, that are listening. You know, please, you know, um, all of these people are important. I mean, there's, like you said, there are other people. I would love to see somebody do something on Hazel Bryant. She died too young. And this woman was amazing. She did the first major black theater festival in New York at Lincoln Center. That was the first time I met her uh, when Shirley Pendergrass was doing the lighting. People like Rosetta Lenoir. You know, we need to remember these people. Uh, and also Ellen Stewart. You know, Ellen Stewart never thought the black community cared for her, but, you know, she needs to be uh, recognized. So I really commend LaDonna for Sisters in the Struggle. I mean, you know, a friend of mine, Faye Me, a stage manager. It meant so much to her to be recognized. And, and even Shirley Pendergrass, you know, uh, wasn't until much later in life that, you know, we, we, we would see things written more about her by other people. And so, you know, these people were so important. And Mickey Grant, you know, um, you know, I, I thank you for recognizing these women and, you know, having this book as a source of a textbook. You know, not only did you have them written in the, in the book, you've got audio tapes of all these people. So that makes it, you know, <laughs> thank you for saying that. I, I feel it, it that- It makes it even more valuable. Thank you. I, I feel that, first of all, thank you for saying that. That means a great deal because I, I respect you and you're an inspiration to me. Um, but, I, but I also wanna say that, that what you're alluding to is the fact that within theater history, the stories of black women and their voices have, have at different points in time been marginalized and confined to, to, to the margins of history when in fact black women have always been doing incredible work. And that as scholars, we have a responsibility to recover that work. And that's, that's honestly my life's work. That's the through line between all of the work that I do. And I know I'm not alone in terms of doing this, but we need more people to engage with this. There's this rich, beautiful history. If you wanna know how to combat systemic racism, if you wanna know how to lead a student uh, demonstration, it's right there in the book. They tell you how they did it. We don't have to keep reinventing the wheel. They did incredible work. So if we can remember that and turn to the past, it will give us a better sense of where we are now and where we can be. So that is my hope that the book does that, right? And allowing you to tell your stories. And that was important to me, that you tell your stories. Yes, I provide a framework. I tell you what it looks like before we have a conversation in terms of like, how um, your physical, uh, giving the reader a, a sense of your physicality, right? But it's you voicing these stories. These are your stories. I simply compiled them. So thank you all for sharing with me and for sharing with the world. These stories need to be told. And there's so many more that, that have not been told. And, so, and hopefully people will. Yeah. So, 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 so we are nearing the, what we might call the, the, the lightning round uh, part of, of this of the book launch, you know, in which we're down to about six minutes left. And there are a few questions that have come in via the chat. So um, I'll offer them and then we'll just go through as many as we quickly can. Uh, so the first one is for LaDonna uh, and that is uh, from Jennifer uh, Pierce. Uh, and uh, she asks, uh, Jennifer asks rather, uh, I am wondering if you greeted, uh, I, Professor Forgeman, I'm wondering if you uh, sort of received any resistance in presenting oral history and ethnography as a form of formal humanity scholarship. If so, how do you defend it? So sometimes people can be critical of oral history. Absolutely. You know, you um, know, that it's, I, I think that oral history at times, because whenever, the whole reason that I had to compile an oral history is because these stories hadn't been told, they hadn't been archived. And so this is creating essentially 
a new archive for, for scholars and for students to go back and visit. And so absolutely, yes, whenever you're dealing with marginalized subjects, there's always resistance. And especially when these stories have the capability of moving people to action. And so this, by even compiling this oral history, it's an act of resistance, right? That's the whole idea. And of course, there's going to be resistance to that. And so, yes, I have. I've, I've been told um, different things about this project in terms of not, not what the women have to say, but in terms of the methodology. And that's okay. You uh, others can think that. We know that it holds value and that it's important and that our stories, as Katori Hall says, our stories are worthy of a thing we call the stage, right? To terribly paraphrase. So yes, absolutely. Okay, uh, the next question um, uh, is from Sandra uh, Richards, uh, who's one of, one of my, my heroes, <laughs> you know, I will say. Um, and uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Richards asks, uh, both artists talk about the Black Arts Movement as a golden period of loads of work and wonderful collaboration. How would you describe the atmosphere today? Ooh. I'll start quickly. Yeah. Um, Aduke, quickly. I yes. see things. We <laughs> can do that. Quick. Aduke and I chat. We text each we other. We do. We talk a lot. Uh, first, <laughs> I want to say the book is phenomenal. Everyone needs to get it because my cup was overflowing during my interview. I think we talked for four hours and then she came back. I had so much history to tell her that I wanted her to know about. Um, today, I think the, 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 the a emphasis on you don't have enough money in your budget to mount a show bothers me a great deal. I mount, I'm a producer and a playwright and a direct. I mount shows if I have $5 and I want to mount a show, I mount the show and go out and find all my people, all my tribe, and I raise all my money. And I've been doing this since I was 21. There's no such thing as I can't put my show up or my dance up because I have no money. I have a thing about that. I We do. We're rich people. We're rich spiritually and culturally. You go put it up. You negotiate, you barter like they do in West Africa. You sit on the ground with the white guy and say, listen, I need to use the Rialto Theater, which I did last year. And what can you do for me and I do for you? I'm going to pack the house and it's not packed over here. Number two, black folks don't come to the Rialto Theater, really. I'm going to bring 1,100 of them. You have to be able to bargain like i learned that in west africa you sit on the ground and say i have something you need and what i have is phenomenal and let's talk money should not be an issue with producing our work it should not be now those who say don't come to me unless you have a budget i totally ignore that i did a festival at new york university with Barlow thompson senior and each one was put in two dollars to start the festival at new york university and thousands of people showed up and we made a lot of, of Naira from that show. We had no money, it was four of us. I don't wanna hear the issue about I have no budget, I'm not budgeted. All of these talented artists will work with you if you can learn to trade something they need mm -hmm. and you can give them an environment that is artistically phenomenal. That's great. Okay. Okay. Uh, also, I, I, I think we're going through another Black theater movement, um, and I—I uh, I mean, obviously, a lot of it has to do with the George Floyd. But I'm thinking in terms of designers. I'm seeing more designers that are coming out of these graduate programs. Uh, it seems like we go through a wave. There was a bunch of us mm -hmm. that came through the '60s and '70s, and there was sort of like a lull. And then, like in 2000, you begin to see all of these black designers uh, that are really doing wonderful things. And and I think during this period, you know, you know, we've got all these plays on Zoom. So there's a lot of new works that are being written. And I think festivals might save uh, Black. I mean, I've always been big on festivals. We got the National Black Theater Festival. I have a colleague here who started a festival in Durham. And then um, we've seen some of the theaters come back. I'm really happy to see what's happening with Caramu Theater. Uh, also Gary Anderson's Theater in Detroit. And you all may have heard about, you know, a lot of money is being poured, not a lot, but there's been funding coming into a lot of these black theaters, uh, Dr. Indira, and I can't think of her last name, at the Billie Holiday Theater. I'm seeing a lot of um, 
sort of like a rejuvenation of a lot of these black theaters. So I think, you know, post COVID, I, I have a very good feeling about what is going to happen in terms of black theater. That's great. Yeah. And, and, and we are pretty much at time. So just to, to wind down, I want to say thank you everyone for being here who are tuning in. I want to thank our panelists, but most importantly, I want to thank LaDonna Forsgren for uh, authoring uh, and creating this oral history, Sisters in the Struggle, uh, which is published by Northwestern University Press. You can buy it online. It's available now. Yeah, Forsgren is the, is the special code for a 35% discount. But thank you so much to University of Notre Dame for hosting the session. Uh, Northwest University Press, Pranisha Jones for like publishing with a dynamic book and I encourage all who are committed to rigorous scholarship to publish with Northwest University Press. Uh, Platform Production Company for facilitating this conversation, the YouTube chat, but most importantly, a powerful, dynamic, uh, massively impressive, tremendously influential scholar, LaDonna Forsgren for bringing us together and inspiring us with all your work. Thank you. Great. Can I give a shout out to Diane Fenderhues, who's the uh, professor of African-American studies at Notre Dame for introducing me to LaDonna. Thank you, Diana. I hope you're listening. All right. So thank you, everyone. This Bye -bye. was fantastic. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.